y'all grim rise and hope you're doing well um i wanted to come on and add a few footnotes to the research about colonel john whitaker senior so i noticed something when i went back and listened to my video that i did the other day about paranormal research um and if you haven't seen that video i'll put it in the box so i noticed when i was reading about john uh mr mr whitaker's marriages it said in in the information it said and i'll put this link where you can read it for yourself it said mr whitaker or john married a second time to Fairby pearson on april 17 1786 in wake county north carolina my mother's birthday is april 17th not just that john married his third wife elizabeth walton on september 29th my mother's sister's birthday, which is my maternal aunt's uh, birthday, is September 29th. So I've been talking with um, Queen Vivian behind the scenes. She sent me a lot of information. I'm doing a lot of digging on this because we've come to the conclusion that I was married to white men in a past life. And it's because of on my father's side, they in, the indigenous tribes married a lot of British men. They married patriots, of course, and then they married British men. My father's side's last name is British. My mother's side's last name is French. So on my mother's side, there's Cherokee and some other, I want to say maybe Shawnee, but probably just mainly Cherokee. I haven't gone as far as I can go in that research on my mother's side. So there's Gullah Geechee ancestry and or also known as Angolan ancestry. There's Cherokee. There might be some Shawnee in there. There might even be some Seminole. I don't know. Um, I just know that uh, there could be <clears throat> quite a few tribes intermingled. Um, like I said, there that that part. My mother. So my mother's father, my paternal grandfather, is from Charleston, South Carolina, Buford, Camp Buford area. Okay, his mother um, looked like a mulatto or more like his mother and some of her pictures look like a mulatto and then in other pictures she looked like she was part Indian and part black but because her skin some pictures she looked mulatto or biracial black and white other pictures I found um, an old ID card um, of hers where she used to work and mine this is my gram this is my mother's grandmother okay so this would be my great great grandmother i found one of her id cards and her skin was so coppery and you could see like she just looked straight native american on the on the work id card so i'm not sure what all is mixed in there i just know that my last name is bellamy and we're we're related to white and black bellamy so okay so I just know that, and, and it's got to be, of course, slave ancestry, because I found out that the owner of one of the plant, one of the main plantations that my ancestors came from was a Dr. John Bellamy, who was from France. His father was from France. When his father died, he left it to the son. The son then freed or allowed those slaves to be free if they wanted to be free and do their own thing, and a lot of them actually stayed on. This was around Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay. I also have cousins and relatives in Wilmington. I don't know them that well, but I do know we have people there because they would come down to the family reunion. So that's my mother's side. That's just her father. Her mother, though, is from Suffolk County, Virginia, from a little place called Zuni, Virginia. You know, so back, so far back up in the woods that the that the roads wasn't even paved good. So I mean, they were paved, but you could just tell that it was way back up in the country. So Zuni, Virginia. That last name on that side is Fulgham, F-U-L-G-H-A-M. That is a British last name. So you got Bellamy on my father's side, grandpa's side, Fulgham on grandma's side. So you got South Carolina and Virginia. Then you got North Carolina too. And then on my dad's side, you got all kind of names, Greyjoys, uh, Seacocks, and... Or is it, what is it, is Seacock a, Greyjoys, Greens, Barnums, a bunch of names. So, either way it go. 
the story in the family always was that we were Piscataway Kanoi and all that. And, of course, you know, some people went in, my aunt called herself doing the genealogy research and saying that it was malarkey. It's not malarkey. It's not malarkey because if you do the research on the last name, it's British. The Piscataway Kanoi intermarried with a lot of British, okay? So it's not malarkey. There are a lot of black, so-called black people around Virginia, D.C., and Maryland who are indigenous, but they're black. They, they call them black, okay? That's one of the reasons why the Piscataway Kanoi were not recognized and given federal lands because they're mostly black people. They mostly look like light-skinned or moderately toned black people. That's mostly what they look like. Now, when it comes to this colonel, there's no, there's no way this is a coincidence that my mother was born on April 17th and he married his, his second wife on April 17th. It's no coincidence that my aunt, her sister, was born on September 29th and he married his third wife on September 29th. All the dates in the year, there's no coincidence there. So me and Vivian have been, you know, kind of putting, um, brainstorming and looking. We think that I could have been married to one of these men. Now, not John Whitaker. She thinks that I may have been married to a white man associated with either him or another man who is known as, hold on, let me get the name. So we think that I may have also been associated with a General John Ash, who again, Revolutionary War. So I'm going to give you a little bit more about John Ash. There's two white men with the name John. The name John means a certain name. It's, a, I want to say, beloved of God in uh, Hebrew. It's, it comes from the, it's a derivative. John is a derivative of Yohanan um, in Hebrew. And so I don't have all of my screenshots because I can't view the screenshots and record this at the same time on the same phone so i have all this research i'm putting together long story short but she came across another general who is from the american militia his name was john ash senior so you got colonel john whitaker senior who lived from 1745 to around 1816 and then you got uh, General John Ash, A-S-H-E, Sr., who was living from around 1720 to October 24, 1781. So they were alive at the same time period, and they were from the same region. Now, I had a vision the other day, before I tell you about General John Ash. I had a vision the other day. I want you to listen carefully when I read you his information because I'm I'm somehow connected to these two men. I've already shared that my ancestors had a lot of dealings with the British. One of my ancestors married the colleague of Lord Baltimore, for which Maryland is named, Baltimore, Maryland is named, Mary Kittamacund, and that's spelled M-A-R-Y-K-I-T-T-A, M-A-Q-U-U-N-D. Kitta McCund. She was the daughter of a chief. She married. She became like a house girl, and then when she got older, she married one of Lord Baltimore's colleague, colleagues. So, she was Piscataway Kanoi. Now, my family, my grandmother and her people are from Prince George's County. That is where the historical marker for Mary Kitta McCund is located. It's located in Prince George's County. I mentioned King George when I read the research in. Colonel John Whitaker's video the other day. So, I had a vision the other day of where I was in Revolutionary War women's garb and I was sitting in a house and a bunch of British soldiers kept coming in and out of the house. Red coats. This is tying me back to why I often use that terminology and y'all have heard me say this a lot. Washington's turncoats. Because the Piscataway Kanoi, the Nanticoke, the Delaware, these are tribes. Nanticoke, Delaware. State of Delaware is named for the tribe of Delaware Indians. Of course, we know General George Washington crossed what? Crossed the Delaware River. 
the Nanticoke and the Delaware were some of the tribes that the Piscataway Kanoi uh, traded with, and all of these tribes were intermingled with the British and the Patriots. However, when it comes to Washington's turncoats, we know about Benedict Arnold and, and a lot of other things that went on. But we also have a, a bred, excuse me, a broad history of the spies, um, which were women and men, both Patriot and British spies. And there were some that were called, that were considered so-called slaves who were also spies. Now, if you want to see this in action, you want to check out the show on Netflix called Turn. Now, I don't know if it's still on Netflix because I haven't checked the catalog because, you know, Netflix cycles stuff out every now and then. You know, you go back to find something, it ain't there anymore. But it's a show called Turn that was debuted by AMC, which also produced um, The Walking Dead. I remember when the show came out, I was fascinated with the show. I didn't get a chance to watch all the episodes when it was on network TV because it would come on late at night. And I was in, I think, online school at the time and I didn't have time to watch it. But when I found out they put it on Netflix, I went back and watched it. And I was fascinated with the show because in, one, in the show, one of the prominent spies was a black woman. One of the prominent spies who was in the house of a British colonel, meaning a red coat, who was passing information that she would hear the red coat say when you know all the big all the big brass as they call it the members of the ivory tower would come and sit around the table and be smoking and drinking she's serving them and hearing and picking up information and passing information to the patriots as a black woman i told y'all that i had past lives associated with spying and i and being an operative and assassin type of stuff covert operations just let's just call it covert operations for short so there was a black woman in that show who was passing information to the patriots to general george washington and his generals and colonels and stuff she was she managed to get into the house of a red coat colonel a high-ranking man who was very wealthy and uh he actually treated her very well he didn't treat her like a slave he she was very trusted so i had this vision the other day of being in a house it was a patriot house but there were red coats coming in and out of the door um and i'm not saying red coats disrespectfully but i'm just saying british british soldiers coming in and out of the door most of them were high ranking they weren't just like your run of the mill corporals they were high ranking men because of the brass they had on in the kind of um the decoration of their uniforms i remember in the vision because it just happened the other day it was very brief i was sitting at a a loom weaving but i was also sewing and i remember feeling like when they were coming in and out of the door i was being polite but i was side eyeing them and it was at that moment that I knew that I was up to no motherfucking good. <laughs> up to no good in their eyes, meaning I was a fucking spy. I was doing something. I was, you know, like, okay, yeah, I'm just here sewing and y'all motherfuckers coming in and out of this house. But I'm, I'm picking up information that I need to pick up. I don't know whose house it was, though. But Vivian said that I'm connected to both of these men. Colonel John Whitaker Sr., who is Wake County government, and this man... Colonel John, actually he's a general, he's not a colonel. Colonel John Whitaker Sr. is a general in the North Carolina militia. They lived at the same time, they're from the same area. The other, this other man here is a general, General John Ash Sr. He was a speaker of the House of Burgesses in the province of North Carolina. He was a Harvard educated, he was Harvard educated and fought in the North Carolina militia during the French and the Indian War. Here's the French coming up again, because on my mother's side, there's French. During the American Revolution or the Revolutionary War, he attained the, make, the rank of Major General and was in charge of North Carolina militia and state troops between 1776 and 1779. So this general was over John Whitaker, because Colonel John Whitaker Sr. was also elevated to the rank of Major in his militia. But he goes by Colonel, but he was elevated in the research that I saw to Major. He was a Major in the militia. 
So this man was Major General, and he resigned from military service at the Patriot defeat, guess where? At the Battle of Briar Creek in 1779. I just told y'all about Crabtree Valley and Crabtree Creek. Briar Creek is in Raleigh, North Carolina. If you've been to Raleigh, you know Briar Creek is a very nice shopping area right off of I-40 between Durham and North and Raleigh. Briar Creek, you can Google Briar Creek, North Carolina, and you will see Briar Creek. John Ash Sr. was, the Patriots were defeated at the Battle of Briar Creek, so they were defeated by the Redcoats, the uh, British. So, John Ash was born March 24, 1725 in Brunswick County, North Carolina. Uh, I think I have been to Brunswick County before. He died October 24, 1781 at the age of 56 in Sampson County, North Carolina. He was a patriot, so his allegiance was the United States of America. His service or branch was the North Carolina Militia. He was in service from 1775 to 1779. He was a major general. His unit was the New Hanover County Regiment and the Wilmington District Brigade. The commands that he held was, oh my gosh, I didn't even see this. The commands that he held was the North Carolina Militia and State Troops and the Wilmington District Brigade. I just told you I have ancestors and cousins and, and stuff in Wilmington. Taking this back around now, here we go with Ichabod Crane, okay? Who was, if you know your history, a British man who sided with the Patriots. He went against the crown and sided with the Patriots. Why am I bringing up Ichabod Crane? Because that show, Sleepy Hollow, that starred Nicole Bihari, and who's a black woman, and Tom Meissen, who's a British man. I have referred to Sleepy Hollow several times on this channel. Sleepy Hollow is available on Netflix. It tells the story of the two witnesses from the book of Revelations and how they go against the dark side to prevent the dark side or the demonic from bringing about Armageddon. There's a lot of witchcraft, sorcery, Freemasonry, and occult information in that show. They also bring up the cremation of care ceremony. Moloch um, is in that show. But the thing about it is, Nicole and Tom, even though Tom was married to a white woman, he's married to a witch in the show. Tom who played Ichabod Crane. So Ichabod Crane was married to a witch named Katrina. She was played by Katia Winter. I was wondering why the fuck the show got canceled because a lot of people liked it. And it was very good information. The show got canceled allegedly because Katia Winter, the white woman, disliked the, the relationship between Nicole Bahari and Tom Meissen, meaning the romantic nature. Like they were becoming more than friends in the script. You could see the chemistry build between them as the show went on. Apparently, uh, Katya had some kind of problem on set and Nicole left the show. That's why the show stopped at a certain point. It wasn't because of lack of interest. It, she left the show. And they tried. They did a fifth season with somebody else playing their part. They killed off Nicole, the black woman's character. Guess who the black woman was, though? The black woman was connected to a line of witches and slaves, excuse me, house, I'm just going to say house women, okay, and spirit, they were psychics, they were mediums, mediums, they were channelers, so she had psychic gifts, she discovered that, she was on the police force, but she discovered, she, matter of fact, she was working for the sheriff's department, I told y'all <laughs> that the sheriff's department wanted to recruit me, she finds out she's got psychic gifts, and, and the story builds from there. So apparently Katia Winter didn't like something, and it was tense, and Nicole left the show. The show went downhill after that. Fourth season, they killed off Nicole, uh, who was also known as Lieutenant Abby Mills. They killed her off, and then they had a Hispanic woman replacing her in the fifth season. It dropped off after that. Black woman left, the shit did, died. So, one of the things that went on with the black community was they didn't like that show because they said it 
promotes interracial dating. It promotes interracial marriage. Black women and white men, we don't like it. And I talked about that on my old channel, Cosmic Jewels, which was in the divestment, the swirling, and <laughs> interracial dating or marriage sector, okay? I talked about how they didn't like Sleepy Hollow. I love the show. I resonated so strongly with the show that I've watched it front to back like four times. All, like all the episodes I've seen like four times. Because something was drawing me and I didn't know what. Now I'm understanding that not only was Major General here, General John Ash Sr. associated with the, he held the command of the North Carolina militia and state troops in the Wilmington District Brigade. I have cousins and people in the Wilmington area. Plantation owner, uh, John Bellamy, I want to say his name was John Bellamy the Third. plantation owner, uh, is, was the one that let the last bit of the slaves go, connected to my family, and you will not believe this shit, guess where Sleepy Hollow was filmed? Wilmington, North Carolina, if you look up Sleepy Hollow and, and ask where it was filmed, it'll say Wilmington, North Carolina, so, I've referred to Ichabod Crane before. There are earlier videos this year on this channel where I talked about Ichabod Crane. Now, I am not sure how I connect in with all of this. I just know that I definitely have past lives where I was married to or associated with white men. That is why I married a white man in this life. So people can be mad or feel some kind of way. I didn't. I knew it was something past life connected once I got deeper into my spiritual path and more things became unveiled and revealed to me and that is also why one of my closest friends here in I want to say yeah one of my um associates here is white okay I've dated other white men in this life one of them was Irish there's some kind of connection to the Irish as well because that came up in the vision. There's a Celtic connection. Okay. I have a Celtic cross knot tattooed on my right shoulder blade. It's a protection cross knot. Uh, there's a connection also because my first name is Celtic. It's Breun. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but Breun, B-R-E-U-N-E, -E, is the source word from Celtic language. It means strong. It's Breun connected to or transliterated into Brianna. A Brianna. I don't know if it's pronounced Breun or Brianna or what, but that's the source word in Celtic. That is my first name. Last name is French. Middle name, not sure. You know, but I mean, I'm sure, but I can't remember. I didn't really do a lot of research on my middle name. Either way it go. What Vivian was saying was that I was married to white men or one of these men I was closely connected to. And or some of their colleagues, like I said, my ancestor was married to the colleague of Lord Baltimore. And we're trying to figure out What's going on here? Now, when I refer to Ichabod Crane, the two witnesses of Revelations, of the book of Revelations in the Bible, if you want to read about the two witnesses in the book of Revelations and the visions or revelations of St. John the Divine, definitely Google that and do your research on that. The interesting thing was John, excuse me, not John, Tom Meissen, who played Ichabod Crane, and Nicole Bahari, who played Lieutenant Abby Mills in Sleepy Hollow, were the two witnesses. They discovered that they were the two witnesses that the Book of Revelations prophesied. Um, St. John the Divine was also John the Baptist. Okay. When I read about General John Ash Sr. here. It says he was born at Gravely, New Hanover County, North Carolina, which is now Brunswick County, North Carolina, on March 24, 1725. So that means he was an Aries. He was a Pisces Aries cusp. His parents were Elizabeth Swan 
and John Baptista Ash, John the Baptist. His father was born in England and settled in the Cape Fear region of the province of North Carolina. And he was a member of the governor's counselor and died in 1734. Now, I said Colonel John Whitaker, the other man, was on the state senate in Wake County and in Wake County government. So, here is John Ash also having a father who was a member of the governor's council. So, all these men knew each other. John Ash was a member of Harvard University class of 1746, but did not graduate. He settled on the Northeast Cape Fear River where he built a plantation called Green Hill. He served as a colonel in the province of North Carolina militia during the French and Indian War, which the French War was from 1754 to 1763. Both of them, the French and Indian War, were from 1754 to 1763. In 1752, he was elected to the North Carolina House of Burgesses and served as Speaker of the House of Burgesses from 1762 to 1765. His father, John Baptista Ash, this last name, Ash, guess what it means? Ashe. That's what it is. It's transliterated to Ashe. So you have the African bloodline in here too. And energy in here too. Ash, Ashe. It's, it's spelled A-S-H-E. That's how a lot of people write Ashe. So... His father, John Baptista Ash, or Ashe, served as speaker in 1726 to 1727. He was known for his eloquence and strong will. An outspoken opponent of the Stamp Act and eventually a supporter of independence from Great Britain, Ash served in the North Carolina Provincial Congress and on both the communities, excuse me, committees of correspondence and safety as hostilities between the colonies and Great Britain began to rise. As a result of his opposition to the Stamp Act, he resigned his royal commission as a colonel in the militia and was elected colonel in the Patriot Militia by the people of New Hanover County in 1775. In January 1776, he was commissioned as the commandant, commandant with a rank of colonel over the volunteer independent rangers. Leading a force of 500 men, Ash destroyed the British garrison of Fort Johnston, which is now present day, which Fort Johnston was near present day Wilmington, North Carolina. He destroyed that shit in 1775. Raising and equipping this unit at his own expense, Ash led his regiment in the American victory at the Battle of Moore's Creek Bridge on February 27, 1776. The unit was disbanded after this battle. So this man had enough money to equip his own unit he had enough money to outfit and equip 500 men we talking old money here so what i'm saying is it's okay if they didn't give my tribe no no fucking money and they don't want to identify us federally they gave us state recognition they said you know y'all can run casinos and shit but y'all ain't getting no lands and y'all ain't getting no money that's okay because see i told y'all about spiritual money. Here's some man I was related to. Somehow. I hadn't figured out the connection exactly yet. Two men. But both both was plantation owners. One of them was on Raleigh government. Wake County government. The other one was on Wake County. One of them was a judge. The other one on Wake County government. This one had enough money to outfit 500 men. So. On May 4th. 1776. John Ash Sr. was commissioned a Brigadier General of the Wilmington District Brigade of the North Carolina Militia. Under his leadership, he constructed defenses for an anticipated British assault on the Cape Fear region. However, the British bypassed Cape Fear and went to Charleston instead. Here go my other ancestors coming in here now. From the Charleston. Charleston. That's how they say it. Area. They don't say Charleston, they say Charleston. Okay, then on November 8th, 1778, John Ash Sr. was commissioned as North Carolina's first major general and placed in command of all of North Carolina's militia by Governor Richard Caswell. So he would have been over. He was over, of course, Colonel John Whitaker Sr. So I don't know why these two men are connecting with me, but I'm going to find out eventually. Briar Creek. I uh, used to shop in Briar Creek 
and I used to live next door to Briar Creek. Uh, the distance from where I lived, let's see. I lived, when I said I lived on the border of Wake and Durham County, I lived off of Page Road and North Miami Boulevard in Durham. And if you look on a map, you will see just how close North Carolina Boulevard, excuse me, not North Carolina Boulevard, North Miami Boulevard in Durham County, Page Road, which intersects with North Miami Boulevard, and Briar Creek are. We're talking a distance of one and a half to two miles. So I lived in the Briar Creek area. There was a creek that ran by my house that was the Briar Creek and its little tributary streams. Okay, so now we have a man that's connecting here with me in a place that I used to live in. Um, there are other native influences uh, when it comes to tobacco because Durham, North Carolina was a major tobacco producer. So that's the Native American influence as well with the tobacco and the cigars and stuff. Uh, they still have the old tobacco factory standing in Durham. They turned them into like really, really nice um, loft homes, condominiums, and shopping centers. So let me tell you about this here now. Briar Creek. This is Major General or General John Ash that I'm talking about says he was dispatched to support Continental Army Major General Benjamin Lincoln following the British capture of Savannah, Georgia in late 1778. We know that Savannah, Georgia is very, very much a paranormal investigator's paradise, okay? You're going to find you plenty of ghosts around Savannah, Georgia, okay? Uh, I personally love Savannah. I've only had the pleasure of going once or twice when I was very young, but um, I've longed to go back. So, the British captured Savannah, Georgia in late 1778. Ashe, excuse me, I keep saying I want to say Ashe. Ashe's troops first marched to Purysburg, South Carolina. Now, I don't know where Purysburg used to be. Let me look right quick. Purysburg is an unincorporated community in Jasper County, South Carolina. The town itself was abandoned. The settlers were successful. The town was located on the South Carolina bank of the Savannah River on 40,000 acres. Okay, so it was on the South Carolina side of, oh my gosh. Okay, let me read this because I, I, you guys need to know this too. Check this out. Purysburg, a.k.a. So Puris, Purysburg is P-U-R-R-Y-S-B-U-R-G. It's also known as P-U-R-Y-S-B-U-R-G. P-U-R-R-Y-S-B-U-R-G-H, like the British spelling, P-U-R-Y-S-B-U-R-G-H, P-U-R-I-S-B-U-R-G, and P-U-R-I-S-B-O-U-R-G, was named after Jean-Pierre Perry from Neuchâtel, which during this time did not belong to Switzerland as it does today, but it actually belonged to the King of Prussia. Puri, a man using slave labor, labor, led the first settlers there in 1734. Puri first delivered his plan to the Duke of Newcastle as a representative of the Lord Proprietors, but roused no interest. He got no interest. But by the time Robert Johnson became the royal governor in 1729, it fit very nicely with his needs and instructions. So, you got a Frenchman here trying to strengthen and expand the frontier settlement by any European Protestants to block the French. So, excuse me, Swiss. He was Swiss. He was not French. He was Swiss. You got a Swiss man here, a Swiss man here who was trying to strengthen and expand frontier settlement, meaning American settlement by any European Protestants to block French and Spanish expansion. Okay, so they were trying to snatch up as much land as they could. By 1736, there were 100 houses and as many as 450 settlers in this new Purysburg, South Carolina. The settlers were primarily French and German-speaking Swiss Protestants from Neuchatel and Geneva, Switzerland. Did I not mention German Hessians before? Now, German Hessians were mercenaries. Let me continue. 
At its peak, the town likely had fewer, fewer than 600 settled residents, excuse me, but the settlement suffered from disease and an unhealthy atmosphere. The settlers also had difficulties due to overlapping land grants. Over the next few decades, many of them moved on to other towns in South Carolina or the newly developing Georgia. Georgia. <laughs> All right, now. It says, archaeological exploration at Perrysburg includes studies in the 1980s by Lepionke, Elliott, and Smith. More recently, the town site was explored by archaeologists with the Lamar Institute for its Revolutionary War Battlefield. As of 2010, the remaining American de Priori family lives in Tampa and Pensacola, Florida. So there's the Seminole. I told you Seminole. I told you. There's, it says the remaining of the Priori family lives in Tampa and Pensacola, Florida. There's a, t there's a Seminole connection there. So let me go back to what I was reading about John Ash. It says... So Briar Creek, I talked about Savannah. So Ash's troops first marched to Perrysburg, South Carolina, where Lincoln had established his camp, meaning Benjamin Lincoln, Continental Army Major General Benjamin Lincoln, had his camp in Perrysburg. But General Ash was then sent north to join the forces that were threatening Augusta, Augusta, Georgia which was being held by British Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Campbell. So it was being held by Redcoats. Ashes advance in early February 1779 prompted Campbell to abandon Augusta and Ash followed him southward into Georgia. So basically, when the Patriots came up towards Georgia, the British fled south and the Patriots followed them south. So Perrysburg is north of Georgia. Of course, it's in South Carolina. So when they were coming down towards Augusta, the British abandoned it and went further south into Georgia. Ash halted just above Briar Creek. So Briar Creek is in North Carolina. So apparently Ash was coming down through North Carolina, advancing as he went. He halted just above Briar Creek in Wake County, where the British had burned out a bridge during their retreat and established a camp while he traveled back to South Carolina for a war council with Lincoln. So he wanted to have a war council with Benjamin Lincoln, the red coat. No, Benjamin Lincoln was not a red coat. He was Continental Army. All right. Ash returned to the Briar Creek camp on March the 2nd. So he returned to North Carolina on March the 2nd. Lieutenant Colonel Campbell had, however, been very active, meaning Archibald, Colonel Archibald Campbell, who was British, the red coat had been very active in a plan that was well executed by Colonel Mark Prevost. Most of the British force embarked on a lengthy detour to flank Ash's camp, while a diversionary force demonstrated on the far side of the burned-out bridge. The British approached his camp from the rear on March 3rd, the Ides of March. Remember, I was talking about March 1st, March 2nd, March 3rd, the Ides of March. This is dating back to Julius Caesar. If you want to hear me talk about the Ides of March, definitely go back to around the August 4th, 2020 time frame where I was talking about Beirut, Lebanon and the Ides of March and how that explosion was about money. And didn't they burn that fucking port out? Well, we talking about a revolutionary war battle over a burned out bridge, which, of course, back then you used rivers and creeks and tributaries to port goods. Okay. To move goods. So these, there's so many spiritual connections here. There, there's probably millions of them. All right. So the British approached John Ash's camp around Briar Creek. They came in from the rear on March 3rd with Ash's force having just 15 minutes to notice and prepare for this onslaught. Ash's poorly trained and supplied militia were routed with an estimated 150 casualties compared to around 16 British casualties. Ash was subjected to a court-martial, which found that although he was not entirely to blame for the debacle, he was guilty of setting inadequate guards around his camp. Okay. So, in his service record, it says, John Ash Sr. was colonel over the New Hanover County Regiment, North Carolina, militia, early 1775. He was colonel over the Volunteer 
Independent Rangers of 1776. He was Brigadier General of the Wilmington District Brigade of North Carolina Militia, 1776 to 1778. And he was Major General over all of the North Carolina Militia and State Troops between 1778 and 1779. In the show, Wash, uh, uh, Turn, Washington Spies, on that was an AMC show that I said should be on Netflix. If it's not on Netflix, it's probably on another platform. The house that the black woman was in, the, the house woman, I don't want to call her a slave, but it is what it is. The house that the black woman was in, who was passing notes to the Patriots, um, of things that she would hear the British say in the house. She was in the house of a major general. So that's notable here about John Ash Sr. because he was major general over all of the state and militia in North Carolina between 1778 and 1779. Now, I need to find out so after he resigned his commission, William Smallwood of Maryland was selected to command the North Carolina militia, militia between 1780 and 1781. All right. Capturing death, returning to Wilmington, Ash remained active there in suppressing the loyalist activity in the district. He was captured and held as a prisoner of war following the town's occupation in 1781 by the army of General Charles Cornwallis, motherfucking Cornwallis, first Marquess Cornwallis. Y'all, if y'all know Revolutionary War history, you know who Cornwallis was. Okay, that motherfucker. <sighs> Why does that make my blood hot? Contracting smallpox while imprisoned, Ash was paroled, but died in Sampson County on October 24, shortly after his release. All right. So it continues on about his history. It says one of one of John Ash's sons, who was John Ash Jr., served as a captain in the Fourth North Carolina Regiment. He, okay, so Governor Samuel Ash, for whom Asheville, North Carolina, was named, was his younger brother. So we talking old money, powerful people. Another thing, I am connected to Asheville, North Carolina. Number one, I wanted to move there. Number two, I visited there several times. So see, here's more indication that Spirit has sent me to a bunch of different places. Had no idea why. It's bloodline related. It's history related. Um... So let me tell you this a little bit. So John Ash Sr. married Rebecca Moore. This was about his family. He, she married Rebecca Moore, M-O-O-R-E, who was sister of Judge Maurice Moore and General James Moore. So her brother, her brothers were once, one, one of them was a judge and one of them was a general. Between John Ash and Rebecca, they had four sons, William, Samuel, John, and Accor. None of those sons left children, and they had three daughters, Harriet, Eliza, whose husband, William H. Hill, was a U.S. District Attorney. So, see, John Ash and Colonel Whitaker, Colonel John Ash Sr. and Colonel John Whitaker Sr. both had very powerful people in their families. So, one of his daughters had a husband, William H. Hill, was, who was a U.S. District Attorney. Like I said, his wife, John Ash's wife, one of her brothers was a judge, the other one was a general. And Mary, who married in Austin and whose son, Joseph, was the governor of South Carolina. Now, we got some, I know some Austins. I know a lot of Austins. So, John Ash Sr.'s. Daughter Mary married in Austin, and their son Joseph was governor of South Carolina. And this, their son Joseph, who was the governor of South Carolina, 
was the husband of Theodosia, the daughter of Aaron Burr. Now, who was Aaron Burr? Let's find out. Aaron Burr was an American politician and a lawyer. He served as the third vice president of the United States during President Thomas Jefferson's first term from 1801 to 1805. How does this tie my family in? Because the descendants of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson are in my family on my father's side. As you know, Thomas Jefferson had children, quite a few, with his slave or housewoman, Sally Hemings. They tried to deny that shit. Those descendants of those children are in my family. I said that a long time ago. I said it on my other channel too. I don't know what the cousins is or where they are. I'm just saying they in the family because it's from the same region. We've we've determined that they're in our family. Because those people have blonde hair and blue eyes, but they're black. Some of them have blonde hair and blue eyes. Okay. Aaron Burr Jr., like I said, who lived from February 6th. 1756 to September 14th, 1836, was an American politician and lawyer. He served as the third vice president of the U.S. during President Thomas Jefferson's first term from 1801 to 1805. Burr's legacy is defined by his famous personal conflict with Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton, anybody? That culminated in Burr killing Hamilton in the famous Burr-Hamilton duel in 1804. So Aaron Burr was connected to Sir John Ash Sr. Because Aaron Burr was married to one of his daughters. Let me make sure I got that right now. It's a lot of information here. Yes, it says Mary married in Austin. Their son Joseph was governor of South Carolina. And he was the husband of Theodosia. And Theodosia was Aaron Burr's daughter. So, in other words, these are like by marriage. So, Aaron Burr was related to John Ash Sr. by marriage. John Ash, John Ash Jr. Excuse me, served as captain in the 4th North Carolina Regiment. Governor Samuel Ash, for whom Asheville, North Carolina was named, was his younger brother. And other descendants who are not named Ash, since none of their male children actually had any children. So John Ash's sons didn't have any children, so that side of the line got cut off. They have continued to play a role in North Carolina politics, including Margaret Ash Pruitt, who was arrested as part of Moral Monday during the 2013 North Carolina legislative protest. I remember hearing about Margaret Ash Pruitt. I, I, I know about that because I was living, was I living in, I was living in North Carolina in 2013. I lived in North Carolina from, in, Rale in uh, Durham County on the edge of Wake County and was all around there for a good seven years between, See, I moved up there 2008 and I moved back down here to South Carolina in the end of 2014. So almost seven full years, because seven full years would have been May of 2015 that I um, would have been up there seven full years. So I was there like six and a half years. But uh, yeah, I just want to share this information with you because, you know, people might be like, well, why she marry a white man? I was married more than likely to some white men in a past life. Like we've come to that conclusion now. We also see where there is some connections here with the Kings Mountain Mine, which is a gold mine in Lancaster and Chester counties here in South Carolina slash close to the border of North Carolina. Um, the fall of last year, late summer, early fall last year, I would drive up. There's a, a back road going up through Camden, South Carolina. Camden, C-A-M-D-E-N, is Battle of Camden, Revolutionary War. Okay. I would drive on the back roads because a lot of times there would be a lot of traffic on I-20, Interstate 20. And so I would drive on the back, I found this back route and when I was driving through there, up through Kershaw County, Chester County, Lancaster, Lancaster County, back around Lake Waterie, back up in the woods up in there. Um. I could feel the energy. I could feel the Revolutionary War energy. It's very hilly back there. Um, it's really indescribable driving through there. It's hard for me to describe what I felt. It felt like I was going back in time. It felt familiar to me. Um, 
it's very interesting the feeling that I got and I love driving there so much that I don't take the main highway route now I just I drive that route when I have to go to Charlotte sometimes and I'm coming from this this city I take that back route because it takes me along a historical pathway of the Revolutionary War uh, militia and the battles the Battle of Camden was a major victory for the British in the southern theater of the American Revolutionary War it occurred on August 16, 1780, in Camden, South Carolina. A lot of people died in that war, okay? In that battle, excuse me. It was a devastating defeat that was suffered by American patriots. All right. Um, this was a part of the early British military offensive in the South. After the British captured, captured Charleston, in May of 1780, British forces underwent, excuse me, let me, re, let me rewrite, let me reread this. The Battle of Camden was one of several devastating defeats suffered by the Americans in the early stages of the British military offensive in the South. Now, I'm skipping over words and feeling so many different energies because so much stuff is coming and flooding to me. After capturing Charleston in May of 1780, British forces underwent General Charles Lord Cornwallis's established British forces under Cornwallis. Let's just call his motherfucking ass Cornwallis. Established a supply depot and garrison at Camden as part of their effort to secure control of the South Carolina backcountry. In July, American Major General Horatio Gates marched his army into South Carolina intent on liberating the state from British control. As Gates neared Camden, word of his movement reached Cornwallis at his headquarters in Charleston. The British commander immediately left the city to take the field against Gates. The armies approached one another north of Cam Camden early in the morning on August 16, 1780. After a brief skirmish, Gates formed his men for the battle. He made a critical error in his deployment. Under the custom of 18th century, 18th century warfare, the most experienced units were placed on the right of the line. Gates positioned the veterans from the Maryland and Delaware line on the right. So here we go with Maryland and Delaware again. I just talked about the Nanticoke and the Delaware in Prince George's County in Maryland. So when we talk about Gates, you need to refer to Henry Louis Gates, the researcher. All right. He should have recognized, however, that his opponent would do the same. The American commander positioned inexperienced Virginia militia under Brigadier General Edward Stevens on his left. When he arrived on the field, Cornwallis formed the veteran 23rd and 33rd regiments of foot on his right to face Stevens. The regiments were led by one of his best line officers, Lieutenant Colonel James Webster. When the British advanced and presented bayonets, the Virginians immediately turned and ran. Their flight carried to North Carolina militia in the center of Gates' line, and the American position quickly collapsed. Okay, so we had Delaware, Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina militia, as well as South Carolina, fighting together in Camden, down here. So it wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't no damn coincidence that my Mary, my mother... Um, had me with my father, one of them being from South Carolina, one of them being from Maryland. My father was born on Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. So this just goes to show that uh, there's so many things that connect us to the places that we live and the people we are. The Continental Regulars from Maryland and Delaware, however, withstood the onslaught. So the Maryland, the Maryland and Delaware um, militia was more skilled and they were more seasoned. They were regulars. They withstood this onslaught by Cornwallis's uh, colonel, Lieutenant Colonel James Webster. Under Major General Yoan DeKalb, were we talking about DeKalb? D-E-K-L-B, DeKalb or DeKalb County, Georgia. I will bet money without doing the research that that's what DeKalb County is named for. After Johann DeKalb, the Continental, he was a major general. The Continentals remained on the field as Gates and the rest of the army fled. Nearly surrounded and overwhelmed, many joined their comrades in the retreat. 
Among Gates' casualties were DeKalb, who was mortally wounded. He died several days later in Camden. Now, we talking about the Battle of Saratoga and all of this in here now. Gates' defeat cleared South Carolina of organized American resistance, so they squashed the resistance. And it opened the way for Cornwallis to just ride on up through South Carolina without nobody standing in the way and riding to North Carolina. Approximately two months after Camden, Major General Nathaniel Green accepted the command of the Southern Department and replaced the one-time hero of Saratoga. Saratoga. Green went on to play a critical role in the Carolinas. Green, spelled G-R-E-E-N-E, -E, went on to play a critical role in the Carolinas directing operations that eventually led to the American victory. Why is this pertinent? That's my, okay, I'm just going to say I'm related to people with the last name Green on two sides. The Greens that I'm related to have no E on the end, but we know that over time you can drop the E or you can keep the E. If they misspell it, they can misspell it. There's with the E on the end and without, but I'm related to the Greens without. It is not a coincidence that the Greens that I'm related to without the E on the end are also from North Carolina and places like New Jersey. Okay. Camden, New Jersey. Camden, South Carolina. I'm just going to say that I'm related to somebody who is from New Jersey. Is it any coincidence that we have Camden, South Carolina, which is right up the road from me, Greens, which I'm related to, and then somebody who's a green by marriage from Camden, New Jersey area. Huh. So Henry Louis Gates, Dr. Henry Louis Gates is um, who I was talking about. Then this website goes on to talk about major battles. Of course, you can do your own research if you want. I'm not going to put a whole bunch of links in the box because a lot of people are not going to read them anyway. But you can just look up the Battle of Camden if you want more information. You can look up Colonel John Whitaker Sr., um, the North Carolina Regiment. The regiment that John Whitaker Sr. was a part of, which is the Colonel, um, I don't have it right offhand. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it. But Colonel John Ash, excuse me, General John Ash, Major General. Some people list him as a Major General, others say Brigadier General, because he did serve several different um, posts. Now, here we go with Charleston again, because there is a place called the Colonel John Ash House. It is an 18th century house at 32 South Battery, Charleston, South Carolina. The Battery, if you've been to Charleston, you know what the Battery is. Okay. The house's date of construction is unknown, but it was built sometime around 1782 and it was renovated in the 1930s. In August 2015, the John Ash House replaced the James Simmons House as the most expensive house sold in Charleston, where it fetched about $7.72 million. So the John Ash House fetched around... 7.72 million when it was sold in 2015 august 2015 the house stands on a, on lot 45 of a subdivision in the peninsula of charleston known as the grand model plan this house was built um, of black cy cypress wood and is a georgian double house also known as a block house meaning king george georgian era it features a three-story piazza across the width of the southern facade overlooking a white point garden and oh, or excuse me, overlooking White Point Garden in Charleston, and has a cupola on the hipped roof. Mr. A. Kenlock McDowell bought the house in December 1937 and sold it to Ash Mead F. Pringle Jr., the vice president of Merchants Fertilizer Company in 1944. So back then it was around forty thousand dollars asking price, but it just sold for seven point seven two million in 2015 so we talking old money here as i said before 
So when people wonder, well, why you meant, why you do this, why you do that, some things are in our genes, and that's just what it is. Okay. I don't know how all I connect, or the ways that I connect to these two men from the Revolutionary War, but I know that we are coming to the conclusion, especially with their bo their first names both being John. We're coming to the conclusion that I was married to and or deeply connected to white men, both British and Patriot, in a past life. The other significant thing is that Colonel, or excuse me, Colonel slash Major General slash Brigadier General John Ash Sr., for which this house is named for in Charleston, John. The other one is Colonel John Whitaker Sr. That one's John. Both of them had sons, they're seniors because both of their sons were also named John. In my family, on my father's side, there is a John Sr. and then there is a son, a junior, also John. Or a derivative of John, I'll just say a derivative of John. So, this is not a coincidence. None of this shit is coincidence, I don't believe in coincidence. Okay, so, I believe my trip up through Chester and Lancaster, Lancaster counties through Camden was purposeful I believe that's why I feel a draw to that route there's something along that route that I need to see I need to go and look um, at some old maps and it's gonna take me a while to get all the research together because I'm printing stuff out and making a notebook and putting clues together but the fact of the matter is Colonel John Whitaker senior is looking for something and from what Vivian said Vivian said that if I help him, he is going to bless me. So when I tell you that those of us who are unassuming or who have a modest life or who don't who aren't richy, 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 rich with the tangible money, you don't know what kind of spiritual money we have because these are two men who were extremely rich and high powered connected to a lot of high power people. Then I got other people, like I said, my ancestor who married the colleague of Lord Baltimore. If you're rubbing shoulders with a Lord who a city Baltimore is named after, is, hey, you got some power. You know back then that the nobles didn't rub elbows with just anybody. Their colleagues weren't the the, the candlestick maker and, and, and the blacksmith. Their colleagues were other lords, okay? Other dukes, duchesses, and so on and so forth. Major General Brass rubs elbows with brass usually so this is what i mean about spiritual riches i don't know what kind of blessings might come i know this man is associated with mining so however i'm able to help him i'm going to help him he seems to be very happy with that and the reason why i say he seems to be happy with that is because i said good morning and he said you know um, i said you know i'm going to do my best to find out uh how i can help you and he said well you know it's all right doll i sure do appreciate it that's how he sounds. Okay. I sure do appreciate you. So, in short, I've had a lot of alliances with white men. Maybe that's why they don't ever fuck me up when I get pulled over riding dirty. See, I don't be riding dirty now. But in the past, my motherfucking ass had been riding dirty one time with an expired tag with a pistol in the car. Yes, I had a permit. They could have gave me a fine could have gave me some trouble they never give me no trouble see there's some kind of spiritual thing there when i go into courts of law when the few times i have gone the judges always seem to favor me that's divine favor but it's also ancestral favor all right believe it or not when these judges are ruling most of them do have spiritual gifts now even if they're of the narcissistic sociopathic psychopathic sort personality wise they still have spiritual gifts so you don't never know who's in the courtroom whispering and who's sitting up there whispering and telling that judge what to do telling telling that da telling that you don't never know what's going on behind the scene right so this is just going to show and validate what i said before I am a spiritual judge. No, I don't have a Juris Doctorate, but you see that I'm related to two men who were judges. I don't know how I'm related to them exactly. With historical records, with it being almost 2021, it takes a long time to piece these things together. But I'm making 
intuitive, spiritual, and literal connections of places I've lived, places I've been, my my living relatives, my deceased relatives, ancestors, family tree information, etc. Okay. Also, the greens that I'm related to were not just associated with New Jersey um, and Virginia and D.C. and Maryland. They're also associated with North Carolina. So, see, I just talked to you extensively about North Carolina. Both of these men are from North Carolina militias. Both of them had judges and governors in their family. Both of them were associated with either the House of Burgesses or the North Carolina State Senate. Okay, so when I told you that I had to draw a pool into law and politics, but I was stopped, this is probably why. When I tell you that I have past lives with spy, spy uh, covert operations type of stuff, this is why. Okay, now I haven't figured out the Russian connection yet. Um, I talked about the King of Prussia, but that's Switzerland, France area. Um, I haven't figured out the Russian connection because I've told you about, um, for those of you who didn't know, I did, I had some portaling reports where the Russians came and got me in an astral experience. They, um, they destroyed a whole town and came and got me. Now their, their purpose wasn't to destroy the town for me. They, in the process of coming to get me, destroyed a town and then plucked me out and left the rest of my family there. And when they came, when they took me to a compound, they took me to their leader and they were speaking to me, they were smiling at me, and I was asking them why they were taking me in English, and they were smiling at me and talking to each other in Russian, and when they took me to the compound, to the leader, the leader was speaking to me, um, well, on the way they were speaking to me back in Russian when I would talk to them in English. So I probably knew Cyrillic in a past life. That's probably why Vivian, being Russian, is so connected to me. She says she feels very spiritually protective over me, and she doesn't, we haven't figured out exactly why, but her guides make her give me information, and I am often on Astra with her. I've never met Vivian in my life, but she instantly connected with me, and she's Russian, of course. This is, I connected with Vivian, she's a moderator on my channel, long before I ever had the portaling experiences with the Russians, but... This is connected to why I married a Finnish man and why I ended up next door to Russia. I don't know why exactly. I just know it's past life stuff there. Uh, the Russian aspect, we still got to figure out. Uh, the German Hessians. Um, French Huguenots. Or Huguenots, however you pronounce it. French Huguenots were the ones who uh, owned some of my ancestors, so-called owned or oversaw some of my ancestors, Dr. John Bellamy, Dr. John Bellamy the third plantation owners, they were French Huguenots or Huguenots, uh, they, which is French Presbyterians. Okay. So, a German Hessian is a German soldier who served as auxiliaries or mercenaries for the British. The term German Hessian is an American synecdoche for all the Germans who fought on the British side, since 65% of the Germans came from the states of Hesse Castle and Hesse Hanau. Here we go with Hanau, Germany. If you remember, I did a decode on Hanau, Germany, where they had that damn stabbing. Let's take it on back. It says the, Ger the Hessians came from Hesse Castle and Hesse Hanau. It's a synecdoche. Hessian is a synecdoche created by Americans. Okay, so the Hanau Germany stabbing, I did a decode on that. When did I do that? That was April 2020. So if you go back to April 28th, April 27th, April 28th, April 29th, 2020, you'll see a Hanau Germany decode on my channel. I knew I was led to do it for a reason. <laughs> like I said, I don't give information and, and, and say stuff that I'm not led to say. So this man, uh, excuse me, it might have been actually, this was, okay, so there was a stabbing near Frankfurt, but the Hanau shooting, it wasn't a stabbing, it was a, sh it was a shooting. There was a, a gunman who was suspected of killing nine people at two shisha bars in Germany, in Hanau. 
go back to February 20th, 2020, 2 2 2020, 2 2 2020. Vivian, that's why 202 came up that you wrote me. You said, what is 202? 2 2 2020, Hanau, Germany. Now, I don't know what my, and then I tied it into Hanau, uh, Hanoi, excuse me, Vietnam. Now, I got to go back to some of these notes because it's been a while. But I'm just throwing out little codes here for future reference. Okay. In reference to the mining. Um, I don't know if this man has a buried treasure or something like that or, or what, but either way it go. Um, Vivian said that if I help him, I will be, he's going to bless me and I can feel that. So this is, um, confirmation of the other messages that I've gotten that have said, uh, you're going to reap a lot of blessings, uh, a lot of your how can I say you've been cut out of a lot of people have tried to hold back things that were rightfully yours. So I don't know if me helping this man will lead me to some discovery. I don't know. Um, either way it go. The readings have been coming out saying that you're going to your rewards are coming. They just wanted to make sure, meaning the spirit guys in the powers that be the spiritual powers that be wanted to make sure that you didn't have certain people karmic people attached to you and when i say karmic i mean negative people okay negative karmic people attached to you and so i am a psychic medium as i said um this man didn't have to connect with me but he did and i know a lot has been hidden from me uh, people tried to get me not to trust my gifts People try to get me not to know I had gifts. They didn't want me following it. It was a mission from the dark side to prevent me from being aware. It reminds me of the story line in Sleepy Hollow with Nicole Bahari and Ichabod Crane, where the demonic tried to scare Nicole away from trusting her gifts. And what happened was Nicole and her sister, even after they saw visions of Armageddon, and the demons and things like that the state put them in a mental hospital and they said y'all are crazy y'all don't know what y'all don't know what y'all's talking about and the dark side tried to get them wrapped up in that shit so that people wouldn't believe them and then so what she did was she assumed that she did she pushed it she repressed it she said well i didn't see that you know um that was just a tumultuous time in my childhood that must be some kind of imaginary thing that I made up or my, a hallucination that I had because of the stress going on in my family and it really didn't happen. And then she found out that it was prophetic, that it really did happen because somebody else saw the same thing. Somebody that was what she thought unrelated to her. Okay. So this reminds me of that story and that's probably why I was really drawn to that show. And this is why I'm better off as a so-called lone wolf because when these kinds of when this kind of information comes in, I can't have, you know, family relatives and 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 clingers on that are not spiritual trying to divert me from this path. That's why a, a marriage was never going to work with that individual and in fact, um I'm not sure a marriage will work with anybody because The paranormal research can go so in depth that if you have a spouse that's not in the same line of work or is not a spiritualist or an occultist like I am or not a psychic medium and not aware of these things and how they work, they will become jealous and they will try to stop you from your mission or the dark side will use them to stop you from your mission. For all I know, I could help this man and suddenly... I'm, I find out some information that could be a huge financial blessing. I don't know. Um, what I do understand is there's something attached to me that is very financially abundant and wealthy um, because 
a lot of men have come to try to use me for that purpose pretending to love and then try to use me for the money now some did really love me but i'm just saying uh some of them have tried to use me for the financial aspect um that's been more frequent since i had my spiritual awakening so to speak i've always been awake in a way um and you know that awake is kind of like it's a it's a misnomer because as long as you're in the matrix you're still kind of sleep but you're not fully awake until you get out of here but when i say awakened when i um allowed myself to see things that were not filtered through a religious lens through a um biblical lens only and i realized that there was so much more that had to be considered and understood regarding the universe the earth the cosmos the multiverses etc the ether that's when i noticed the onslaught of gold digging gold digging ass niggas gold digging men goddamn gigolos and so that's why i don't do relationships because i have male spirits also and i and i'm not saying that these are spirit husbands i'm not saying that i'm saying they need me to work i gotta work okay mm. that's another reason why my children live with their dads because At least for now, because there's so much spiritual work that I have to do that literally it would it was is like a it would be a conflict of interest. Um, and it's not to say that women don't juggle both, but I never had the fam I didn't have the family support like that. So if I have to go out in the field and investigate, who's gonna watch my children? Nobody's gonna take no one's gonna first of all people never wanted to help me in general the only time anybody ever helped watch them was if i had something going on they would go to their dad's no problem but as, as far as the other relatives the only time they would watch them is if i was damn in the fucking hospital they was not trying to help me or give me no break other than that so that's why uh it was a blessing that my children went to live with their dads because where this spiritual path and work is going um it's hard to include children in that it's it's is it's damn near impossible it's damn near impossible um i won't say some people can't do it but other people are not me so other people don't have sickle cell other people don't have limited energy like i do so if i got a spirit i gotta help or do research for um it could take me a long period of time to get that done of consistent work now while i love being a mom and um all of that i'm just saying this was there was some kind of intermission in my children living with me for a good reason i i don't know all of the reason but there was an intermission for a reason and i know it's of a spiritual nature so I also noticed that so one of the things that Vivian said was that I'm like one of the I'm, I'm one of the main ones in this area that these spirits can connect with all right so there may be more coming all right and I feel like there will be more coming because now they see that I'm willing to speak publicly, that I'm willing to do whatever I need to do, that I don't give a fuck what people think about it. You know, now they see that they can trust, okay? This is not just about celebrity tarot readings. It's it's just in general. It's just in general. They know they can trust me, so they're going to come and communicate with me um, and, and have. When it comes to... People throwing digs and dives and shit. I don't worry about that kind of stuff. Um, I can be petty when I want to be, but for the most part, I don't have anything to worry about because if I got Revolutionary War generals and shit looking after me, your black ass ain't got nothing to say that I care about. And you know who I'm talking to. Okay. So you can throw your little sneak diss. You can say whatever you want to say. That's your right to say whatever you want to say. Just know that your motherfucking ass live in a region where 
my tribe's people. And these white men was kicking ass. Some of these white men are my ancestors. Because, see, you know, black people like to teach you, oh, ancestors. But when they say ancestors, they mean black ones. You don't know how your white ones can help you either. You don't know how your European ones can help you. There is no such thing. I posted on my community tab yesterday. There's no such thing as a pure race anymore. You got every, all kind of stuff in you. Okay. I know in a past life, I had a Viking general, uh, what would be considered like a general as my father. Okay, I've talked about that before. So I was in Norway before. I flew through Norway earlier this year. Um, there's some kind of connection with Kalashnikov. I have not looked in, into Kalashnikov's family though. There are other black women I know that are connected to the Russians. One sister is an occultist and she was saying, you know what, when the Americans was on that religious shit, the, the Russians was in that deep occult knowledge. And it's true. There's another black woman I know who does a lot of research on the Romanovs and Greek royalty. Okay. She's a black woman. And she knows that she was a part of their royal, she was, some, she was somehow related to them uh, in their royal houses. So it doesn't matter what race you are, so-called race you are in this life. You don't know who you're connected to from the past. Who would have ever thought that a black woman would be connected to Revolutionary War major generals from the British and from the American side? Now, these two gentlemen that I talked about, Major General John Ash Sr. and Colonel John Whitaker Sr. are both patriots. But... I just told you the story at length about people that look like me spying. Okay, house women. House house niggas. Just let's just call it that. Okay. Mulattoes, house niggas, mixies, mix indigenous or Indian, mix black, mix white. Okay. We don't care who all these men married officially. Because we know good and goddamn well that they had other women too. And I'm just going to say other women. You read between the lines on that. I don't want to make too many of these racists and these people out here mad. But you know they had other women too. That they told, that they did pillow talk with. Yeah, see, Major General uh, Redcoat does pillow talk with his light brown housewoman. Mm-hmm, see, yeah. Read between the lines on that. She's the keeper of secrets. Right. Not saying that non-black women didn't too, but I'm just saying, don't, don't count us out. <laughs> okay. That's the untold story of Revolutionary War and Civil War history. That there were women like us, women like me, who were doing the dirty, not won't say the dirty work, but who were doing the integral work. Okay. Of keeping histories, passing messages, keeping an eye out on things. Vivian also said I might be um, connected to Ma Baker. You know, Ma Baker was, I don't know too much about her. But before I get off of here, I want to talk about her because I said that my, I said I might have been connected to the mob or, or something. Ma Baker was an American criminal. All right. So Kate Barker, also known as Ma Baker, sometimes known as Arizona Barker and Ari B Barker, was the mother of several American criminals who ran the Barker Carpus gang during the public enemy era when the exploits of gangs of criminals in the Midwest gripped the American people and press. She was born October 8, 1873 in Ash Grove, Missouri and died January 16, 1935 in Oklahoma, Florida. Here we go with the Seminole again. 
His her spouse was George Barker. She's buried. She was buried October first, nineteen thirty-five, at the Williams Timber Hill Cemetery in Oklahoma. Children were Fred Barker, Herman Barker, Arthur Barker, and Lloyd Barker. Parents were Emmeline Clark and or Emmeline Clark and John Clark. So she was a matriarch of an outlaw gang of brothers and allies engaged in kidnapping and payroll post office. Oh my gosh. She was she was crucial, baby. She was crucial. Let's see. Ma Ma Barker or Mar Ma Baker? Ma Barker. Let me see. This she was on some Bonnie and Clyde shit. Guess what? Her parents were Irish, Irish and Scottish. I just talked about the Irish and the Celtic. Ash Grove. Here we go with Ash again. Or Ashe. Ash Grove, Missouri. All right. Um. So yeah, Ma Barker. So we talking about bank heists and all kind of stuff. And Vivian said that I remind that I was reminding her of Ma Barker. Because of how I said that I'm always watching and watching over children and stuff, and that I uh I, <laughs> I always keep something to get somebody with. Well, Ma Barker was one of those type of women. Okay, she's one of them type of women. Now, Ma Barker, they got a picture of Ma Rainey in here too. And that's not coincidence because they got a Ma, they got a picture of Ma Rainey under Ma Barker, because matter of fact, the other day I was watching Viola Davis in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. So that's not coincidence either. They got her picture under here. They got Ma Rainey mixed in with the Ma Barker results in the pictures if you click on images. If you if you Google Ma Barker B A R K E R M A separate word B A R K E R American criminal you'll see all the pictures and then you'll see down at the bottom towards the bottom on the right you'll see or somewhere in there you'll see Ma Rainey but Ma Barker's name is under Ma Rainey's picture so there's a connection probably there too um but yeah, my Barky, my Barker was America's most wanted mother. Wow, <laughs> interesting. Well, I'm gonna leave this like that, y'all. I just want to share these historical footnotes. Um, one of the men who was in the Barker gang ended up in Alcatraz. Okay, just I uh, wanted to throw that in there. And I'm going to have to do more research on her because, again, uh, you never know who you're connected to. <laughs> it's so much that has been hidden, especially from so-called African-American or black people. You never know.